A bill is an idea that someone proposes to be a law. Sound simple? Just wait. For Congress to pass a bill into law, the proposed measure must first go through what is known as the legislative process. The legislative process forces the bill to navigate through a complicated course of detailed rules, formal procedures, and over 200 years of congressional customs and traditions. We'll examine this legislative process and follow a bill's long journey through Congress as it struggles to become a law. The president, a member of Congress, political parties, interest groups, or individual citizens can propose a bill. But there is no guarantee that a bill will become law. In simplest terms, for a bill to become law, it must be approved by the Senate, the House of Representatives, and the President. Bills must be passed within a two-year term of Congress. Otherwise, they die. However, a bill can be brought back from the dead and reintroduced in another congressional term. The bill will then start its long legislative journey again. Only members of Congress may introduce a bill. Bills can take different forms depending on their origins and what types of bills they are. Bills introduced in the House of Representatives are designated H.R. and bills introduced in the Senate are labeled with the letter S. This way, there will be no confusion as to which chamber originated the bill. Each bill is numbered as it is introduced. A bill designated S-1 or H-R-1 is the first bill introduced into the Senate or the House in a new term. Bills fall into one of two categories. The first category is the authorization bill, which grants permission to establish government programs and policies. The second category is the appropriations bill. This bill provides the money to fund the programs and policies permitted by the authorization bill. These two types of bills work together. However, they may have different lifespans. An authorization bill may be valid for several years, while an appropriations bill is usually only good for one year. Whether they are for authorization or appropriation, bills may be introduced in either the House or the Senate. Let's start with the House. The task of legislating is enormous. There are thousands of bills introduced in a congressional term of which only a few hundred are passed. Individual members of Congress could never possibly find the time or have the expertise in all subjects to review all of them. This is why committees are necessary. Committees are small groups made up of members of the House who have specialized knowledge of the subject of the bill, such as expertise in health care, transportation, or education. After a bill has been introduced in the House of Representatives, the Speaker assigns the bill to a full committee, also known as a standing committee. Some bills address more than one subject. These may be assigned to more than one committee to review and screen. This is called a multiple referral. The committee may hold public or open hearings when considering the bill, though there are times when these meetings are held in private or executive session. A bill faces its most intense scrutiny in committee. Its content may be deliberated in great detail, and it can go through multiple rewrites. For even more expert scrutiny, bills are frequently assigned to a subcommittee sort of a committee within a committee. Hearings may take place at this level instead of involving the full committee. Subcommittees may receive input from administration spokespeople and federal bureaucrats. It is not unusual for the heads of cabinet level departments to testify. Scholars and experts may appear and share their expertise on the subject. Lobbying groups 
and private citizens may testify as well. Sometimes, a subcommittee will go on a fact-finding trip to the location affected by the bill. This is known as a junket. After the subcommittee completes its work, the bill is then presented to the full committee. The full committee most often accepts the subcommittee's recommendations on the content of the bill and whether or not to approve it. At this time, the committee may hold more hearings on the legislation and the amendments recommended by the subcommittee before taking any further action. After the hearings are finished, the committee members may meet to consider the legislation in detail. This step in the process is known as marking up the bill. At this stage, the committee can amend the bill, which means to revise or make additions to it. On controversial amendments, a separate vote may be taken. A committee vote will also be taken to recommend whether or not the bill should be passed by the House. This recommendation is known as a report to the House. Most bills simply die in committee, either because they are not reported or because they are pigeonholed, which means they are put away and never acted upon. But those lucky few bills that do survive the committee and are considered by the chamber will most likely pass. These are placed on a calendar, which is simply a schedule of the order in which bills will be addressed on the floor of the House. When a bill is approved by a standing committee in the House of Representatives, it then goes to the House Rules Committee. The House Rules Committee has authority over the flow of proposed legislation from the committees to the floor of the House. Usually, the House Rules Committee acts on behalf of the Speaker of the House, who represents the political party that holds the majority of seats in the House. As a result, the House Rules Committee will promote legislation that is favored by the majority party, whether it's Republican or Democrat. When the Rules Committee has approved a bill for floor debate, it then drafts a rule for House debate. Without a rule, the bill will not be taken from its calendar and will, in effect, die. A rule sets specific terms of debate for each bill. This includes a time limit for debate on the floor. The rule also determines whether amendments may be introduced during debate. There are three types of rules, open, closed, and special. Bills that are too complicated, technical, or tax-related frequently go to the floor under a closed rule, which means that the content of the bill cannot be tampered with or changed during floor debate. Other bills are given open rules, which means that they can be amended on the floor. Some bills are given a special rule, which means that only certain members of the House may amend them or that only certain amendments may be proposed. Once a bill has a rule, the bill can then be debated. Floor action is the process by which Congress debates and votes on a bill. The size of the House of Representatives forces it to follow strict rules and detailed procedures during floor debate. There are 435 members of the House with the authority centered upon the Speaker. In order to do business on the floor of the House, a quorum, or majority of the full membership, must be present. A quorum for the House is 218 members. For most floor action, the House typically transforms itself into the Committee of the Whole. This changes the quorum rule to 100 members and requires that the Speaker temporarily step down from presiding. On each bill, there will be time for general debate, which is regulated by the rule, granted by the Rules Committee. A general debate is often limited to two hours. Debate time is divided equally between opponents and proponents. When debate is over, the House leaves the Committee of the Whole in order to vote, and the Speaker resumes his or her position. Bills can be passed in both chambers of the Congress 
by a majority vote. There are times when votes are taken by methods that make it impossible to tell how a member has voted. One example is a voice vote. No. Other times, there is a public record of how the individual member voted on a specific issue. Electronic votes or roll call votes show how each member has voted. If the majority party in the House fully supports a bill, then that bill will almost always be passed. After a bill has made it through one chamber, in this case the House, it is sent to the other chamber for approval. Now let's look at how the Senate works. The Senate process is more informal when compared to the House. The bill first goes to a committee for hearings, markup, votes, and the drafting of a committee report. The next step in the Senate is floor action, where the differences between the House and the Senate are apparent. For example, the Senate almost always operates under what is known as a unanimous consent agreement, which means it unanimously agrees to set aside any rules. A unanimous consent agreement takes into account all 100 members of the Senate and will not take effect if even one senator disagrees. In contrast to the House, where the Speaker dominates, power in the Senate is not centered around one individual, but is shared by the majority and the minority floor leaders. The presiding officer of the Senate is the Vice President of the United States, who is not technically a member of the Senate. Constitutionally, the only time he or she is allowed to vote on a bill is when there is a tie vote on the floor. And furthermore, I'll have Unlike the House, there is no time limit for debate in the Senate. Filibusters, endless droning speeches designed to stall a bill indefinitely can occur only in the Senate. Filibusters can be ended by cloture, a vote of three-fifths of the Senate, or 60 members. The Senate floor is a more open forum, with personalities and political influence playing a much greater part in the process. As a result of the differences between the House and the Senate, bills rarely pass both chambers in the same form. Frequently, this necessitates an additional step in the legislative process, called conference action. The House-Senate Conference Committee resolves all of the differences between the House and the Senate versions of a bill. This step is the last major obstacle for most legislation. Members of both the House and the Senate serve on the Conference Committee. House conferees fight for the House version of the bill, and Senators fight for their version. Technically, no new ideas may be included in the bill. But, in practice, sometimes bills are rewritten or amended. Differences between the conferees are settled by a majority vote. When the conferees reach an agreement, they write a conference report. This report explains the specific changes they have made. The report is printed and goes back to the House and Senate to be voted on. Bills that have been approved in conference should not be further amended in the House or the Senate. If the conferees didn't agree on any of the amendments, separate votes are then taken in both chambers to resolve the disputed issues. Sometimes a bill will be sent back to the conference committee for further negotiation. The final conference version is rarely defeated. When the bill is finally approved by both chambers, it is sent to the president. When a bill finally reaches the White House, the president must decide what to do with it. There are three choices. The first choice is for the president to sign it, turning the bill into law. The second choice is for the president to veto or refuse to sign the bill, sending it back to Congress with an explanation of any objections. Congress then has the opportunity to override the veto with a two-thirds majority vote and thus pass the bill. The third choice is for the president to take no action on the bill, 
It will then become law after 10 days, Sundays not included, provided that Congress does not adjourn for the year during these 10 days. If Congress does adjourn during those 10 days, the bill will not become a law. This is known as a pocket veto. The bill has now made it through its legislative course. What once started simply as an idea is now a law. The legislative process is very lengthy, complicated, and intimidating. But if ideas make sense, are strongly advocated, and gain enough support, they can become law.